A hand? Did you find a hand? <laughs> yeah, I got two of them. I knew I wanted to get to this movie eventually, and with a baby of our own on the way, what better time than now to remember, look who's talking. Kirstie Alley, John Travolta, Abe Vigoda, and the voice of Bruce Willis? Fuck yeah! Make an incredible combination in this light-hearted but occasionally hard-hitting emotional comedy from 1989. Now, reading the tagline on IMDb, had I never saw this movie as a kid, I'd probably skip right over it, honestly. After a single career-minded woman is left on her own to give birth to the child of a married man, she finds a new romantic chance in a cab driver. Meanwhile, the point of view of the newborn baby is narrated through voiceover. That does not sound that good on paper. But when brought to reality, thanks to its stellar casting, it surprised me then and even now. So let's find out why. And we're gonna skip right over the credits, cause I don't wanna see none of that shit. When we finally open, we're thrust right into the drama as the movie quickly sets the uncomfortable tone to follow. Molly, our main character, is finishing up some accounting reports for Albert, the married man sitting next to her whom she's also having an affair with. Almost in tears at his constant advances, and coming to terms with the fact that Albert is probably never gonna leave his wife for her, she finally decides to break things off for good. Now luckily she's done being used and stands up for herself. Albert. Even if Albert managed to get her top off first. Oh, emotion and lust. I'm gonna burst if you don't kiss me soon. That's not my problem. My problem is, look at the difference in these two. There's a clear winner here. You get Nancy and I end up with Dale. Who's the clear winner there, hmm? Dale? Kirstie Alley in her prime, looking damn good if you ask me. And then old ass curly gray haired Albert. Fucking Albert. No offense to anyone out there named Albert, just this Albert. Why'd she fall in love with this chode to begin with? There were plenty of hot guys in 1989. Now after more baby making credits, Molly is retching in the stall at work, thinking she's suffering from the stomach flu, which her friend Rona quickly sets her straight about. What stomach flu? Nobody has a stomach flu. Neither of these two are quick learners, huh? Meanwhile, inside of her body... To thank the Lord. Ah, that's fucking terrifying! Oh, wait a minute. Oh god, why did I do that? That didn't help anything. Wait a minute. Sir, I do all these things. Look at that. They match. Look, jokes aside, Bruce Willis comes in as the voice of Mikey, narrating everything, and his delivery just makes it so hilarious. What in the hell? The clues are starting to add up, even if they haven't noticed them yet. God, you ate all that already. As the two spy on Albert from across the street. God, if only Beth would stop throwing up. Now later at her parents' house, helping them with her taxes, even a grown woman such as Molly isn't safe from that strong motherly advice or criticism. And I still manage to dress nicely and catch a father. Now, a great scene follows as the movie gives us backstory on the family and makes us feel something for them through the tension between Molly and her mom arguing over Molly's romantic failures. Well, you can't control who you fall in love with. Why not? It's genuinely believable, it's well written, it's a good back and forth, and it actually feels like a real family. And Dad's just sitting over there like... That makes it all the more realistic. Now, continuing to shovel food down her throat to appease her now endless appetite, her mother quickly picks up on the signs Molly and Rona missed, and when Molly takes a pregnancy test soon after, she's devastated. Oh, no. Yes! <laughs> now, as the doctor checks to see how far along she is, Mikey gets the shit scared out of him, and I'll be damned if it doesn't crack me up now as much as it did when I was a kid. Yo, time out, holy cow, what was that? Wow, who's that? It's the whole, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> I, I hurt myself. Now lying in bed later that night, imagining how big she's gonna be soon, the next scene does a great job playing on expectations as we're suddenly shown two glasses of champagne and Albert's all revealing his big news to her that he's got his divorce in the works. And then you're hit with this gag. I knew if I was patient, this day would come. Now it becomes clear now that she's fallen asleep and all of her thoughts and events of the day have turned into a nightmare. I still thought it was hilarious and unexpected. Now the next day she lets Albert in on the news that she intends to keep the child and douchily celebrating the news like he's some sort of douche. Having my baby. 
What a lovely way of saying how much you sick. love. Yeah, Mikey covers this part pretty well, honestly. Please stop singing that song. She gets sick, I get sick. What are you gonna tell people? Now, Albert finally asks the most important question of all, and her mother pretty much delivers the reaction you'd expect. How could you do such a thing? Dad, he doesn't care. You hear this? Now, trying way too hard to cover her tracks, the only way she gets her mom to calm down is telling her that the donor is some hotshot doctor. Columbia's parents live on the island. Rich and all that stuff. And after that, you know what this movie needs? No was moving, she was a montage. No, 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 no. Not even gonna cover it. Nine months go by with baby stuffs. The best part of this montage is at the end when Molly's chugging a shitload of the apple juice and Mikey's just tugging on the umbilical cord like, Hey, yo, let's get a little apple juice down here, huh? Now, as Rona reads Molly some literature on identifying the baby's sex, Mikey himself is becoming aware of those very aspects. Ah, uh, look at that! Another little arm coming in down there. What's it doing way down there? It's so funny. Now, how am I gonna get that in my mouth? God, it's so funny. Now, visiting Albert at work, his fickle and lavish consumer-based lifestyle revolving around overly priced furniture and artwork from cultures he doesn't know shit about come through full force and I just hate him. It's made of stone from the Yucatan Mounds. Beautiful, isn't it? Everything about him. And I have this custom-made mural of an ancient Navajo design. Now, their relationship is about to hit a road bump the size of Molly's belly, though, when discussing the pregnancy, because Albert won't shut the fuck up about his wife, Beth, and how she did this different, and she did that different. When Beth had Priscilla... Oh, I am so sick of hearing about Beth! Beth, 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 Beth! The best part, though, was the performance that follows when Kirsty delivers to Albert with an outburst of emotion all the different choices she's made from Beth during the various steps in their pregnancy, and frankly, they make a lot of sense to me. I have a business degree. She took belly dancing lessons. I buy medical insurance, she buys magic crystals. This shit's too long to put in here fairly, so forgive me while I reorder some of it, make a few little editorial decisions here. When I found out I was pregnant, I decided to make out a will. When Beth had the girls, she had a reading of their past lives. I just don't get it, Albert. Oh, yeah. And to top it all off, you're still with her. Now, after that passionate speech, does Albert have anything to say for himself? Galleria Apartments. That's right. I moved out. What? I've got my own place on 57. <laughs> yeah. They are both idiots. So Carrot Top and Molly are out shopping sometime later, continuing to pace the movie out well, with the two jabbing back and forth at one another like the good friends they are, when Albert comes tumbling out of a nearby dressing room with an unknown woman as he locks eyes with Molly in the distance. Now more hilarity ensues when a pissed off Molly leaves the store in a huff, and as Albert runs after her, both his mistress and Rona come flying out as well to hear his excuses, still wearing the dresses they were trying on. And this employee of the store is out there like, God damn it, get your asses back in the store, you pay for this shit. Please. I'm gonna call the cops if you don't move the dresses back in. Now left alone with Molly, instead of trying to cover his ass as we'd expect, Alfred reveals that he's leaving Beth all right. I'm gonna live with Melissa. Molly, I know this sounds awful, but I'm going through a selfish phase right now. Right now? Really? It just now started? Mm-hmm. I admit the timing is bad. I'm utterly sick of his shit. Molly gives him a couple of jabs to the stomach, and then Rona comes flying out of nowhere, latching onto Albert's back like a crab while Molly walks off in tears. Completely worked up emotionally, the stress is too much and triggers her to go into labor, and lucky for her, it's 1989, so you only got screwed out of like one or two cats back then before you managed to get one. I was here first. Oh, come on, buddy. Now, John Travolta finally comes into the picture here as the cab driver, who quickly realizing the situation he's in, puts the pedal to the metal and races her ass to the hospital as fast as he can. Oh, shit. <laughs> It's what you'd expect, but funny nonetheless. A montage of his crazy driving, the two arguing back and forth about said crazy driving. He even attempts to hold her hand based on what little information he has about women in labor, and you immediately take a liking to him. I got an emergency! He's playing this bad boy tough as shit character, but you also can see there's like a sentimental and caring side underneath. It's John fucking Travolta. Now, driving like a maniac, I at first felt it was a bit over the top seeing him all over the sidewalk endangering so many lives and the lengths the film went through to get across how serious he's taking his job. But when I really started to think about it, damn, I like it that they actually went that far with it. They didn't have to do that. I mean, hell, if you're going to have a bit about driving a pregnant woman to the hospital, why not go all out, I guess? I just got to get Wayne's World 2 out of my head. 
Now Travolta keeps everything so cool and casual with his relaxed questions throughout the ordeal, even if sometimes Molly doesn't want to hear it. You can already appreciate the fact that you know they're going to end up together, even though it, they just met. And realistically, if you think about it, they really only met two minutes ago, even though we're almost a half hour into this movie. So, togetherness, that screen time they've shared, two minutes, this movie's already managed to establish that I might kind of care about their relationship. The ability to make you want to see two characters fall in love because you like things about them and their personality, not just because they look hot, it makes for unconventional storytelling these days, honestly. Now, eventually arriving at the hospital safely? You're struck! My kid will probably be brain damaged because of you! I love how she's beating the shit out of him and the cop is just standing there, there like, mm -hmm, probably deserve that shit. Another deadbeat dad. Or he just don't give a shit because it's funny to him, who knows? It's funny because violence against men is never taken seriously. If this was the other way around and a woman was sat here and a bloke had locked her in a flat and she had to jump out and injured herself, you lot would not be laughing. You would be saying, he's a complete nightmare, he should be locked up and that's disgraceful. But somehow, if it happens to a bloke, that's funny. That's not funny, is it? That is it. Whoa, am I getting political here? Let's get back to the comedy. Now, as the nurses rush her to a delivery room, James, that's his name, by the way, if I didn't clarify that, he's handed a smock and gloves and the works, basically, being mistaken for the father. The laughs continue here, and all that tension we got from the cab ride over continues, if not builds itself up more, as now Molly is in labor, screaming her head off, and Mikey's just bouncing around inside, confused as hell. Okay, this will pass. Oh, watch the head. Wow. Out of nowhere, the movie cracks the darkest joke so far. Slow down your breathing. You're not in an aerobics class. Fuck my breath. It almost feels like it should be out of place based on most of the comedy that's been dealt to us so far, but it, it just comes out of nowhere and kind of works. Hey, hey, you gotta calm down. I'll have to get the exorcist in here. I mean, we are dealing with a movie that lets us hear the thoughts of a baby, voiced by Bruce Willis, so I guess I can't think too hard about this. Finding a doctor for Molly, James brings him into the room where he injects her with some pain medicine, and a joke follows that went right over my head as a kid. Oh, now, that is very cosmic. I don't understand it. Oh. I had no idea that he was stoned as a kid. I just thought it was a funny Mikey moment. What's that little light down there? Distracted by a light below him, Mikey heads down to investigate while in the real world, Molly is deep into labor, pushing and following the doctor's orders. When Mikey comes out, he's in shock, and as the nurses and doctors do their thing, he's panicking at every tool he sees, every face he sees, everything he sees. It's just great. Too long to put in a review under fair use, though, so... You in the gray, please, a blanket, something, I'm frosty out here! <laughs> frosty out here. Frosty! Placed in his mother's arms for the first time, the two immediately connect with one another. So you're the one that's been kicking me. <laughs> you were the one that ate all that spicy food. Oh, it's so cute. I'm a sucker for babies now. Hell, even this one's kind of cute. Where are my thumbs? Where the hell are my thumbs? I want to suck my thumbs! I gotta think about getting my own place. Oh, and that one. I did not think I'd be reincarnated this quickly. Was that racist? What a surprise. Uh... Now later, while he's being cared for, Molly is looking in on him, and as much as she loves him, her sadness at everything is evident as she laments over her choices, promising Mikey that she'll find him a father and give him the life that he deserves. You're the only thing that matters to me, and I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna get you the best daddy there is. God, back at home, Bruce Willis just kept me laughing with stupid shit like this. A hand? Did you find a hand? <laughs> yeah, I got two of them. I look like a Russ Meyer movie. Russ Meyer? That's a name you just don't hear that often. Now eventually James stops by to give Molly her purse, which she left in his cab in the delivery rush, and here he meets Mikey for the first time. Now this crass behavior continues as he cracks jokes at her expense and even lights up a cigarette around the baby. Don't smoke that around my baby! She asks James to watch Mikey for a few moments so she can change clothes, setting some basic rules in place, of course, and the two get to know one another a little better. Well, James and Mikey, anyway. And then there's coffee regular. Give me a regular. Regular what? Coffee. Okay. But flavor. Coffee flavored! Man, Dennis Leary would be proud. Now, as Molly watches from the door, not wanting to admit she's beginning to see something in James, the tension breaks when he borrows some of Mikey's milk for his coffee and Molly reveals its source. That's breast milk. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Hey, man, you're on your own. God, it's these interactions that made this movie so amazing. Some other cast just would not have worked. 
These three specifically made this movie what it is, and something of vital importance would be missing without them that I can't quite pinpoint. I know it's just chemistry, plain and simple, but it's more than that to me. If for nothing else, the age at which I first saw this and how long it's been since. Now later that night, cold and wet and finding no help in his friends. Listen, fellas. Hey. Mikey cries out for mommy who comes in with a bottle for him. It's like a revelation to him. New and powerful information. I start crying and she comes in with a bottle. Well, I can definitely handle crying. <laughs> Cue some quick shots of restless nights, restless days, mixed with some funny bits of Mikey making a mess and crying a lot over a wailing soulful song and got yourself another montage. Over 80% of all women experience postpartum depression. I'm not gonna. <laughs> Still suffering from postpartum depression, however, Molly is crying on the couch with Mikey when Grandma stops by to visit. She introduces herself to Mikey, and sensing a wet diaper, she springs into action. Now, another hilarious scene follows here that kind of drags the joke out for a couple of seconds, and it just works on a couple of different levels. Now, after a new diaper, I really like some of that white stuff on me, okay? Mikey wants the baby powder, and they can't hear him, obviously, but we can, and they aren't paying him any attention, and... Alright, look, alright, just give it to me and I'll put it on. Like I had an affair with give me it, come here. All he wants is some of that powder! So if you could just give him some of the powder, please. I don't know why I care so much. Oh yeah, she's gone. Now paying no attention to the interaction between James and Mikey and ignoring it as a sign of his potentially good fathering skills like a moron, Molly finds herself going out on her first real date, which is an utter disaster. I asked for well done. This is raw. What are you deaf or something? She even imagines what it would be like to have kids with this guy. Oh my times did we go over and over and over and over those logarithms what are you some kind of an idiot god these are great gags they didn't have to go that extra mile but they did although the joke begins to quickly stale when they recycle it again with a new guy and a new date this time with a health and sanitation nut fucking danny tanner i still respect the movie for going through this much effort in the first place why are white socks in the same row with colored socks now returning home sometime later, Molly finds James waiting near the mailboxes, which she finds suspicious, especially after he takes some of the letters that have been mysteriously appearing in her mailbox that are labeled for someone else entirely. You stupid son of a bitch, you're stealing my mail! Confronting him about it, he tells her that he's been using her address for residency so he can keep his grandfather in a decent nursing home instead of out on the street, which is where he would have ended up because he's not a resident of this city. Man, getting all deep with these subplots. Needing the rest of the mail that she has in her apartment, she's reluctant to give it to him, afraid to get involved in any illegal activity involving the mail, so James offers to do her a favor in return, such as babysit for her. Now the two haggle back and forth, nailing down the exact details, which nights, ground rules as well, such as no chicks allowed, Bummer. and their relationship, whatever it is at this point, is developing slowly as their polar opposite personalities collide. All those doctors. All those doctors. All those, look. Now they just argue back and forth over what doctors know best, and you can guess who takes that side. Dr. Spock loves us. I can't believe she's getting that upset about a Vulcan. Big ears, no emotions, right? But it makes for great character development. Now, finally reaching an agreement, James gets his letters, but as quickly as he returns, he finds Molly fast asleep at the table and gently and sweetly picks her up and carries her to bed. How could you not love this guy? Wanting mom to enjoy her nap and not have it interrupted, James takes Mikey out for a drive. Could have left a note at least, dude. If someone had left a note. Although I guess it's strangely in character for James to not leave a note. Now once inside the cab, James gives Mikey his first driving lesson before heading over to the hangar. He loves planes in real life and he's a pilot. You may know that, but you may not. I mean seriously, look at his house. Okay, I got that. What next? Move the big circle around and around. No problem. I almost died as a kid giggling at this part. What are these, jumbos? You must be thinking the same thing I am. <laughs> Lunch. Now, meanwhile, Molly wakes to find Mikey missing, and panic sets in while Mikey himself is safe and sound with James as they visit his father. You know, Grandpa. Oh, man, let me see those things. Let me try and grab one. Oop, oh, there we go. How's that feel? Now, once he arrives back home and Molly has Mikey safely on the table, she lets him know he fucked up. Whoa! <laughs> Beating his ass with a broom, she gets a splinter in one of her fingers, which quickly kills her anger, and as James attempts to dig it out for her, her mother has just arrived outside the door and overhears some of the misleading conversation. I've never had one that big in me. God, even worse when he leaves? 
Now she's all suspicious. Just want to know one thing. He's not the frozen pop, is he? Ma! Another montage ensues where Mikey grows up. We can skip it. Now back at her parents' house, Mom is still doling out the dating advice, citing the three things that she and Molly's father have in common as evidence of their happiness. We're both in a county. <laughs> we like to eat at diners. <laughs> we like to go to the movies. Wow, what a recipe for success. Now, thinking of the perfect guy for her, she sets Molly up with a dude at work at her father's accounting firm, whom we meet in the next scene. Ugh, even Mikey knows something's not right with this goob. Hey, hey don't touch that. I don't... Football? I don't watch football. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Mikey. Hey, it's the bear show. Yay, look at that. No, yeah, I would totally watch the snuggle bear over football any day. So while Mikey and not the teacher from Stranger Things are fighting over the TV remote, James shows up dressed to kill. Ooh, but I sense a sabotage scene about to commence. She hates it when guys like open doors for her. You smooth bastard. Or try to pick up the tab or pay for things. Really pisses her off. You ultra smooth bastard. She liberated, huh? Liberated? Come on. Guy babysitter? You ultra smooth waxed bastard. Now leaving Mikey home with James, Molly heads out on her date with the accountant, and the conversation, yeah, it sucks. He said, I think you better come in and have an ultrasound, so I said, fine. Same. Somewhere in here, he covers it for us. Blah, blah, blah. Now, it takes nothing more than a missed joke to ultimately tell her that this dude is a chump. Is it true that colons look 10 pounds heavier on TV? <laughs> How do you mean? Meanwhile, James is at home being a perfect father to Mikey while Molly continues to ignore her gut feeling about him. Which is good though, because it makes it all the more satisfying when they finally do get together. Kind of like the end of Problem Child. Two. Now cue another montage of James and Mikey having a blast as date night continues with accountant douche taking to heart all of James's advice. And later when the date ends and he's dropping her off, he at least explains himself, but she's rather surprised to hear that all of this was a direct result of what James had said to him. Your babysitter gave me some helpful hints for tonight. Oh, he did, did he? When she marches in ready to murder him, but is stopped dead in her tracks at what she finds. It's so goddamned adorable. I wonder why that was put in there. Hey, Mikey! Hey, what's up with you? you been? Hey, did you get your hair cut? Oh. Either way, Mikey is a little stud muffin, apparently. Yeah, he takes after his... James. That's all he knows him as, and it becomes evident to him in the next scene when playing at the park with two girls and one of their dads takes one of them away. What's a daddy? Now later, while preparing Mikey's food, Molly seems to have finally found some happiness, in herself at least, and doesn't notice James when he peeks around the door, cracking up at her dance moves. And with Kirstie Alley already setting the screen aglow. What could possibly make it shine brighter? Survive when these little minds tear you in two. Then sweeping her into his arms, and both of them dancing their butts off with Mikey watching from his high chair. It's such a sweet moment, and you think, this is it. This is when he wins her over. But not yet. We shouldn't do this in front of Mike. Look, look. Look at the look on his face. We're getting there. I love this next part, too, when James continues to dance around the paperwork and mail debacle concerning his grandpa. That's not what I love. It's the whole cutting the bullshit part of a relationship. You are such a baby. If you want me to do something, why don't you just ask? Now, character building continues along the way as James reveals to Molly ways in which he gets free food and long-distance phone calls on his meager salary as a pilot instructor. Which isn't too subtle in that it's a great way to have her take a look at some of her earlier views and realize that money isn't the answer to everything and the only solution to making sure that Mike he has a great childhood. She wasn't as vain as Albert for sure, but she did seem to have the idea implanted in her mind that money equals success and thereby a good man and therefore a good father, but James is quickly shattering all those expectations. Now the two of them get Grandpa into his new home with a joke or two along the way. Oh my god, this guy's worse at this than I am. And soon after, James takes her for a flight in his plane with a joke or two along the way. Give me your hand. Put it on my stick. I don't want to put it on your stick. Just... Still hilarious, though. Now, that night, as they put Mikey to bed, all the signs are pointing to it. There's not much movie left now, so this is it, right? Ah, they finally kiss. All right. Uh... And he's going to get some. All right. 
That's how you get a sequel. Now, right as it's about to get good, Molly imagines what a life with James and the kids would be like, and reality comes crashing in all around her. Ooh, princess, you're making my mouth water. Leaving him high and dry, she apologetically pushes him towards and out the door. And the next day at work, reality comes crashing in again as Molly's boss is drilling her on some of the work she's fallen behind on, as well as the account of you-know-who who she's abandoned. Now, falling asleep while waiting outside his office, she has a dream where Albert is begging her to give him another chance, and I'm only pointing it out because of this. Yeah, you didn't expect that kind of shit in this movie the first time you saw it, huh? Now, finally forced into Albert's office, Molly is all business and not interested in the slightest in any of Albert's bullshit, but still he persists. Do you have a picture of Mickey? Mikey! Now, she relents, showing him a picture of Mikey, and even allows him an opportunity to meet him later, but when he stops by her apartment later, and she's still at aerobics class, and finds James inside, things go south fast. Are you the, are you the sperm donor? What do you mean, sperm donor? I'm the kid's father. Now, James is not buying a word of this dude's story. Even better, he throws some hard-hitting questions. What's his favorite cereal? I don't know. Cheerios. What's his favorite stuffed animal, Fred or Barney? Fred. That's right. No, Fred. no, no. Barney. How many diapers does he go through a day? About six. Who's his favorite rock star? Michael Jackson. Don't you think a father should know some of these things? Shit, better get those ready to go again because now he's throwing some hard-hitting shots. <laughs> Tossing his ass out the door, James is having his wounds tended to soon after by Mikey when Molly walks in and has to confront the truth head on. Who's Albert? Shit gets intense real fast as Molly reveals that her feelings in all this mean nothing. All she's trying to do is give Mikey the best life that she possibly can. Do you love him? Do you? Now James, feeling betrayed and upset about her lies about Mikey's father, starts questioning Albert's motives. Now in the anger, some things are said. I don't want him seeing Mikey anymore from both parties involved. You really think you're responsible enough to be a father? That they may or may not regret in the morning. You call getting pregnant by a married guy responsible? Oh, that's good. With sometimes. Stop it. Hilarious. That's it. I've had it. Results. Now get out. I live here. I know it. God, what a way to bring in the third act. You know there's gonna be conflict between them when he finds out, but it just feels so authentic. Now back with Mom, the advice continues, and soon after, we find James saying his goodbyes to Mikey. Even talking to a baby, Travolta knows how to act. I don't know if I can keep coming around to see you anymore. Even in all this drama, the movie still aims to make you laugh. El señor está en el cuarto con el bebé. Oh, okay, I'll write you a check. And as James continues his goodbyes, he begins telling Mikey a story about his father, which Molly overhears on the baby monitor. I think being a good father is, is, is keeping the mother happy so she doesn't drive the kids crazy. Whoa, that line hit home big time. James pours his goddamn heart out to Mikey. I miss you. Don't be sad. Here, take this. That almost got me tearing up like a little girl over here. And with that, he's gone. We're gonna go see Daddy today. Oh, great, I was just thinking about James. Oh man, I don't have the heart to tell him. Now arriving at Albert's, the sight of his countless artifacts and tiny, breakable, probably valuable things immediately catch Mikey's eye. Something else catches Albert's. Aren't you a handsome little How about man? a little milk yes. right in your eye there? Damn it! <laughs> Bullseye! Now letting him loose in the room. You will never escape me, Skeletor. Come back here with my great. That implies at some point Mikey has watched a He-Man. I don't know why, but I love that. By the power of Ray Skull. <laughs> now as expected, Albert lays on the charm and the pity act. Mikey sums it up pretty well right here. Ah, is he taking a dump? <laughs> is he? <laughs> Now, taking Mikey over to the Yukon Mountains diaper changing station. That's a $10,000 desk. Now it's junk! I understand you are going through a selfie space. Now, adding insult to injury, both Molly and Mikey completely trash the place while Albert just stands there like a complete wuss. Now, back at home, as Molly is making things right with Mikey after the terrible interaction with his father, she starts thinking about James again, and like magic, James calls, right? Nope. The nursing home where James' grandpa is staying calls. He's become abusive and violent with my staff, and I'm afraid you're going to have to come and pick him up. I'll have to call Health and Welfare. Yeah, that's a pickle. Molly heads over and finds Grandpa belligerent. Mean old bastard! Attempting to calm him down while cleaning him up, he spills the secret onto her that surely touches her heart. Of all my daughter-in-law, you're my favorite. You're smart, and you're a good person. That's why Jimmy loves you so much. 
Now, Mikey seems to be like a calming potion on him while Molly talks to the director of the hospital, sorting things out, just as James arrives and listens in outside the door. Finally, the two come face to face and... Okay, well, let me give you a ride home. Don't bother. Fine. Fine. Now, meanwhile, Grandpa gets distracted by some nursing home booty and puts Mikey down like a toy of little importance. Glancing out the door, Mikey spots a taxi driving by and assumes it's James calling out to him. Well, maybe he's going downstairs. Oh, it's so adorable! Now, setting up the final scenes for us, we start with Mikey wandering off by himself, hitching a ride on a cart, and it's about around here that everyone discovers that he's missing. Mikey, meanwhile, is making the rounds, asking everyone about James and getting some help along the way. Wandering outside, Mikey spots a car being hooked up to a tow truck and hops inside of it, trying his best to remember what James taught him. You see, even that scene had importance. Stick this thing right in here. Yeah, there it goes. Move the circle around and we're off. Now, I know all of this is a forced coincidence, but it's still awesome. Molly and James make it out the door, finding his toy that he left behind on the ground, and spotting him inside the car, they rush into James's taxi and give chase. It's cute because Mikey thinks that every yellow car he sees must be James. Hey, there he is! Hey, James! Now, after driving like a maniac and miraculously not having a single accident, James cuts off the traffic, stopping the tow truck in its path. But when they rush it, Mikey isn't inside. So where is he? Hmm, this looks like a good place to spot him. Oh, shit! A little bit of heart-pounding action thrown into the mix here as Mikey, hearing them call his name, races towards them as fast as his little legs can carry him. And without making it more dramatic than it really is, he safely makes his way back to them and causes a shitload of people to wreck all around them. Yeah, I would not want to have to pay for that. Now, safely on the sidewalk, no one seems to care that they are the cause of all this and ignore them in favor of the wrecks, like the rubberneckers they are. And finally, 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 even though she can't hear them, Mikey's words get through to her. Dada. Well, she heard that one. Probably thinks we're gonna end up together. And that one. Well, I hope they don't get stuck together like that. Yeah, I'm as happy as Mikey. Now, should I tell him I need a new diaper? I don't know why the hell I love this movie so much, but I do. I'll wait. I even love this scene that comes in during the credits, setting us up for part two. Mikey, this is your sister, Julie. Don't start with me, kid. I've had a day you wouldn't believe. That's how you set up a fucking sequel. No final thoughts. This movie fucking rocks. Can we talk?